So, well, I think we can go ahead and get started, don't you think, Megan? I think so. Okay. Okay, so we have an intimate group here today. <laughs> Best friends, too. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, so I'll just get started. Hopefully you can see the screen. You might need to move the, um, with your mouse, you can move the pictures of the people that are walking around. But, um, but as you can see, my first book is Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. And this is a science fiction title. And I will definitely be the first to admit that science fiction is not my first choice for books that I read. But I liked this author's first book, The Martian, so much that when he came out with this one, I definitely wanted to, to read it. And it did not disappoint um, at all. Um, so the main character of this book is a man called Ryland Grace. And uh, we first meet him when he's awakening from a coma. He doesn't know who he is or where he is, but with the mixations and slowly returning memories, he's slowly enlightened. He's a junior high school science teacher on a small spaceship, and he realizes that his mission is to save Earth. So as in The Martian, the author makes science and problem solving not only really cool and interesting, but actually essential to the survival of the main character. So this is an electrifying space adventure that um, was both touching and funny and I laughed. The, um, the character was really funny. Um, you know, along the way, you learn facts about gravity and heavy metals while Ryland Grace races against the clock and builds unexpected partnership while hurtling through the cold depths of space. The book alternates between Ryland on Earth and Ryland in space. And on Earth, we find out about the impending doom that's um, approaching Earth. Um, hint, it's caused by climate change and how the entire world worked together to send this space. And then on the space side of the story, we follow along as Ryland slowly pieces together his memories, becomes familiar with all the equipment on this amazing ship and MacGyver's his way out of trouble again. So this book covered a lot of science, but it was in a very funny, touching and enjoyable way. Um, okay, so my first pick is The Death of Jane Lawrence by Caitlin Starling. And I'm going to warn you today, everyone, that everything I picked, I noticed it's kind of like on the dark side of things. Uh, but I think that's just where I was since it's fall and you know, it's good for gothic and horror and witches and murder and things like that. So everything that I have on my list is kind of in that vein. Um, but this one to start off with, it is, um, it's a gothic story. So um, the main character in this one is Jane Shoring Field. She has been under a guardianship for the past 15 years um, after her parents died in a war and she can't go along with her guardians. Uh, her um, Mr. Cunningham has received a new judgeship and is leaving and it's more expensive for her to go with them than if she stays behind and um, works. But the best thing she's decided, she's done all the calculations, she's decided the most secure path forward is a husband and she wants a marriage of convenience and that will allow her to remain independent and occupied with meaningful work. And her first choice is a doctor named Augustine Lawrence. He's dashing and handsome and he's a brilliant surgeon, um, but he's a little bit reclusive and they meet and there is a certain spark between them, um, but they both understand that this is a business arrangement and he has one condition that he'll accept that she can never visit Lindridge Hall, his crumbling family manor outside of town at night. And um, lo and behold, on, her, on their wedding night, as she's leaving Lindridge Hall to go back to where he performs surgery, which is where she's supposed to, to stay, um, a storm comes by and it strands her and she has to go back to Lindridge Hall. And when she gets there, 
um, you know, the bold, courageous surgeon that she's married is not there. He's terrified, terrified and paranoid, and he can't tell reality from a nightmare. And he thinks that she's an apparition come to haunt him. And in the morning, he's back to himself, but she knows that something terrible is wrong at Lindridge Hall and with the man that she so hastily bound her safety to. And uh, set in the dark mirror version of post-war England, Sterling crafts a new kind of Gothic horror from the bones of the beloved canon. And I read this because I saw it compared to Crimson Peak, which was a movie that came out several years ago at this point. It was a Guillermo del Toro movie. And um, I really liked the movie. It was one of those that was kind of uh, advertised as straight horror, but really it was a gothic romance. And um, Caitlin Starling, who uh, she saw that movie and it kind of sparked um, in her kind of this dormant interest in gothic stories. And so that um, kind of made her write this book. And so it does have kind of all those elements from Rebecca and things like that. But there's also a little bit of a weird science fiction-y fantasy current to it um, because it's set in, it's not set in our world, it's set in a world that's similar to ours, sort of like post World War I sort of era. But um, so it does get a little bit weird, um, weirder maybe than <laughs> your average Gothic story. But it's great if you really like that sort of thing, I would highly recommend it. Okay, um, my next book is called Small Pleasures by Claire Chambers. This was just recently released in the US. Um, it was a big hit um, in the UK and it actually has been long listed for the Women's Prize in Fiction. And um, it's a historical fiction. Um, the setting is 1957 in a suburb of London. And the main character, her name is Jean Swinney and she's a feature writer on a local paper in the suburbs of London. So she's very clever, but she has a very limited career op opportunities. And on the brink of 40, Jean lives a very dreary existence that includes caring for her demanding widowed mother who rarely leaves the house. And it's a small life with little joy and no likelihood of escape. This all changes when a young woman, Gretchen Tilbury, contacts the paper to claim that her is the result of a virgin birth. So Jean seizes on this bizarre story and sets out sets out to discover whether Gretchen is a miracle or a fraud. But the more Jean investigates, the more her life becomes strangely, but not entirely unpleasantly intertwined with that of the Tilburys, including Gretchen's gentle and thoughtful husband, Howard, who mostly believes his wife's story, and their quirky and charming daughter, Margaret, who becomes a sort of surrogate child to, to, um, for Jean. So Gretchen too, becomes a much needed friend and an otherwise empty social life for Jean. So Jean cannot begin to herself to discard what seems like her one chance at happiness, even as the story that she Jean starts to send dark ripples across all of their lives with unimaginable consequences. So this is, um, I would say it's kind of a quiet book because the characters are kind of quiet characters, but the story really sucked me in and even though, you know, it's both a mystery and a love story. Um, and it's been compared to the remains of the day about conflict between personal fulfillment and duty and a novel that celebrates the beauty and potential for joy in all things plain and unfashionable. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, and my next one is Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch by Rivka Galchen. Um, the story begins in 1618 in the German Duchy of Württemberg. Um, plague is spreading, the Thirty Years' War has begun, and fear and suspicion are in the air throughout the Holy Roman Empire. In the small town of Leonberg, Katharina Kepler is accused of being a witch. Katharina is an illiterate widow, a busybody known by her neighbors for her herbal remedies and the success of her children, including her eldest, Johann, who is the imperial mathematician and renowned author of The Laws of Planetary Motion. It's enough to make anyone jealous, and Katharina has done herself no favors by being out and about and in everyone's business. 
So when Ursula Reinbold accuses Katharina of offering her a bitter witchy drink that has made her ill, Katharina is in trouble. Her scientist son must turn his uh, attention from the music of the spears to the job of defending his mother, even as he worries what it will do to his reputation and his employment. Facing the threat of financial ruin, torture, and even execution, Katharina tells her side of the story to her, her friend and legal guardian, her next door neighbor, Simon, who's also a reclusive widower and imperiled by his own secrets. And it sounds like it's depressing, but it's not. Um, there's a lot of um, humor actually in the in the book. Um, and it is actually a, based on a real story. Um, Johann Kepler, his uh, mother was accused of being a witch and he did have to um, leave his post to um, defend her. And the narrative kind of draws from the real accounts from her trial, um, which in the back of the book, the author does link to it. So you can actually go and look at them if you want to. Um, and it's kind of interesting. It's told in kind of alternate um, segments where it's Katharina, her kind of testament to Simon. So as he's writing, like as he's written it, um, and then letters from Johan to, um, you know, to her and to other people um, pertaining to the trial and, um, and she's actually a really funny character. So Katharina, she's um, really likable and she has goofy nicknames for everybody. Um, you know, she calls uh, the lady that accused her the werewolf and her husband is the cabbage. And um, I saw somebody describe it as if um, Olive Kitteridge was accused of witchcraft but actually had kids that like her, um, which sounded kind of accurate to me. And um, so even though it's got kind of serious themes and it's got interesting kind of parallels to um, even our own times now in terms of um, you know, community hysteria and wanting to point blame at certain people for any given thing and um, just being divided based on, on these sorts of things. Um, it's, it's just an interesting, and it's short. It's, um, it's, it's not very big. It's only, I think, a couple hundred pages, so you can read it really quickly, but I highly recommend it. Um, it's kind of got a different feel for a historical novel, and I think that it makes it interesting. Hey, my next book is called Home Stretch by Graham Norton, and it's the same Graham Norton who is the UK broadcaster who's won a lot of BAFTAs and he writes a column for the Telegraph. So he's Irish and uh, but now lives in London. So this book is actually set in a small town um, outside of Cork. And the, the original setting is 1987. Um, when a car accident out this small Irish town leaves three dead the day before a wedding, including the bride and the groom and sends into a tailspin two young men who were also in the car when it crashes, Martin Coulter and Connor Hayes. So over the years, Martin and Connor deal with the repercussions of this accident and wrestle with guilt over the deaths in extremely opposite ways. While Martin attempts to make a mess, Connor buries the past and lies to those around him about his involvement. So with surprising twists and touching moments, Graham Norton explores the immense sense of loss that comes with being a survivor and how nothing is ever truly forgotten for the families of those who died. So from that one off moment of the car crash in the opening scenes, the story does jump around in time, following Connor and his friends and family across decades and oceans as they puzzle out their relationships to home and identity and uncover all of the secrets that led to the crash. So I... Someone described Graham Norton's book as sort of Maeve Binchy like and if you're a fan of Maeve Binchy, which I am, I would totally agree. You know, you really get to know these characters really well and you learn the backstories of all the different um, characters um, in the book. So this is a more contemporary, um, starts in 1987, ends in present day, um, but this was um, a great fast read.
had to unmute myself. Okay. Um, and my next one is also a really fast read. Um, my next choice was Rizzio by Denise Mina. Um, it's actually a novella. So um, it only will take you a couple hours to read it, um, but I highly recommend it. It's uh, basically, it's about um, the murder of David Rizzio. If you know anything about Mary Queen of Scots, he was a private secretary to Mary. And on March 9th, 1566, he was murdered um, by assassins uh, from basically all the noble families in the um, who had been kind of exiled by Mary came back in this plot. And um, she was heavily pregnant at the time. And her husband, Henry Lord Darnley, was in on it. So it basically is the sort of immediate events prior to and then right after. So it all takes place within a very short span of time. Um, but it goes through those events sort of in a really interesting, it has a modern sort of narrative feel to it. It's very immediate. It's very sort of spare in the language that it uses, but it gives this really interesting sort of fly on the wall feeling um, to the action. It's very compelling. Um, the woman who wrote it is a Scottish crime novelist. So she doesn't write historical fiction most of the time. She writes crime uh, novels. And so I think that was an interesting choice because it sort of reads that way, but it has a lot of, it does still have a lot of um, character development and detail about the court and about Mary um, that will also give people who are historical fiction readers something to sort of grab onto there. Um, and this is actually the first sort of in a series that the publisher kind of commissioned that Scottish authors will be sort of retelling um, events from history, myth, and legend. And so this is the first one in that series. So um, she was kind of chosen to write this, but I highly recommend it. Like I said, it's a really quick read. It's really um, compulsively readable and um, I enjoyed it a lot. Okay, my last book today is a nonfiction, it's a memoir, and it's called London's Number One Dog Walking Agency by Kate McDougall. And so Kate McDougall, um, when the book opens up, is working in a safe but, but dull job um, at the auction house Sotheby's, Sotheby's in London. Um, but after a clumsy accident nearly destroys a precious piece of art, she quits Sotheby's and sets up her own dog walking company. And she doesn't own a dog. She doesn't really know anything about dogs. She knows less about opening a business, but she wants to start something new and work for herself. And she, you know, after some research that this is a, a good kind of business to start. So um, she embarks on this very improvised career walking some of the cities many pampered pooch, pooches, branding her company London's number one dog walking agency. So each chapter sort of follows a client and their pet. And so you learn about the different kind of clients, the ones that treat their dogs like their children um, or, as, or as possessions and some that have, you know, leave her very detailed lists of their likes and their dislikes um, and what they should and shouldn't do with the dog walker. Um, and it also, you know, as her company grows and she hires more dog walkers, you also get to know some of her dog walkers. So between the clients, the dog walkers and the pets, you really get a great glimpse into, you know, a slice of, um, of life in London at this time. And, and over the years, you know, this becomes sort of like a coming of age story for, for Kate as well. And because one walk at a time, she journeys from sort of happy or 20 something life to a happily and surprisingly settled adult with love relationships drama and some home ownership along the way and um you know you meet greedy labradors and pampered pugs and also equally interesting owners so it was a cute book it was a fast read it was one that you could just pick up you know one chapter at a time and you really wouldn't lose you know a lot of the story and this was set in 
the book starts in 2006 and this was sort of like the beginning of like pampered pet culture you know when uh i feel like now it's pretty you know set at least he you know um but it was it was interesting to see the the transition um there so this was a cute fast read and now i feel bad because we're going from a really cute fun read to a not <laughs> cute and fun read. <laughs> um, the last one on my list is The Case of the Murderous Dr. Cream, The Hunt for a Victorian Era Serial Killer. So um, in the span of 15 years, Dr. Thomas Neal Cream poisoned at least 10 people in the United States, Britain, and Canada, a death toll that at the time that had almost no precedence. Um, structured around the London murder trial in 1892 when he was finally brought to justice. The book exposes the blind trust given to medical practitioners as well as the flawed uh, detection methods, bungled investigations, corrupt officials, and stifling morality of Victorian society that allowed Cream to prey on the vulnerable and desperate women, many of whom had turned to him for medical help. Um, so basically, um, he was born in Scotland and raised in Canada, and he married a woman, well, he was forced to marry a woman um, because he got her pregnant and um, performed an abortion on, on her. And, um, and that sort of seemed to kind of flip a switch in him. And um, he, uh, later fled to the United States because um, he basically like left her for dead um, and he came to Chicago. So he came to Chicago. He had um, uh, an office in the West Side and he performed abortions and a lot of them were um, uh, sex workers. And so, you know, he was able to kind of progress from that into murder and people didn't really notice because you know like the Jack the Ripper case there's so many cases you know people on the fringes of society that he was able to kind of prey on um the police just didn't kind of put two and two together and he um was caught in 1881 he was sent to Illinois State Penitentiary for life but he got out 10 years later um because his family basically paid for it and they let him out and he went back to England and then started murdering oh. again. And um, in London, he was known as the Lambeth poisoner. He would put strychnine in um, gelatin caps and give it to people. And so it would poison them, but because of the way that he um, put it into the pills, it was like a delayed reaction. So, you know, they would leave his practice and then die later so that they wouldn't put two and two together, but it kind of goes into, um, you know, Scotland Yard trying to investigate and they send um, a detective to the United States who then finds out about, you know, what he was doing here in Chicago and puts two and two together and realizes that the Lambeth poisoner is the same person that was doing these murders in the United States. And that's how he finally gets brought to trial in London in 1892 and then he was hanged. And, um, but for a long time, he, you know, it was a very, very famous case at the time. Um, weirdly, you know, it was kind of between H.H. H. Holmes, Jack the Ripper. While he was waiting on trial in London, I believe Lizzie Borden happened. So it's like all these murders, murderers, Victorian murders were happening around the same time. And I think he kind of, um, because Jack the Ripper, I think, um, kind of eclipsed him and I think people have kind of forgotten it so this book kind of tells that story um, and just about and it's not just about him but about the era um, you know the development of the detectives and, and Scotland Yard and everything like that so it's really interesting so if you read like Devil in the White City because it's pretty similar and that sort of um, the way it's written, um, you would definitely like this one. Well, thanks, Megan. 
Okay, I'm just going to move the screen up a little bit and I'm just going to share really quickly while we're all together here. In case you guys are looking for any other programs to sign up for, um, there is one tonight that Mike and Susan are on and it's another virtual program. So you don't even have to leave your house to sign up. And um, it is uh, the holiday gift guide. So um, Mike and um, Susan are gonna talk about, and they're really, I think a big focus on technology and they're gonna make a lot of gift suggestions. And then the next two programs are actually in-person programs and they are going to, uh, the first one is December 2nd and it's online shopping hacks. And so it's gonna learn um, techniques you can use to beat the system and find discounts on everything from snacks to eBooks. And then the final program is a kitchen tech program and the focus is on kitchen knives. And they're gonna cover the most common knives, offer buying tips and share tips on caring for your knives. So those are some programs that are coming up tonight and in December that might be of interest to you. And at this time, I wanted to ask if anybody, now that Megan and I covered the books that we've recently read and enjoyed, if there's anything that you've read and enjoyed and wanted to share with us, we would love to hear about them. Do you have anything, Carolyn, that you've been reading that you have wanted to share? Or? I'm calling you out, sorry. Calling me out all the time. Sorry. Well, um, I, agree, I, read I, this, I read this book, The Guest List, by Lucy Foley, F-O-L-E-Y. I read it a while back, and I believe Linda, also my girlfriend, also read this book. Um, you know, it, it touches on a lot of social issues that are present with, I don't know, dysfunctional families all the time, <laughs> sister <laughs> sibling, you know, fighting and infighting and jealousies and uh, 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 the, the man in the book that uh, the mystery is around, he is a, um, uh, an only son of a private school professor, if I can remember correctly. Linda, you can step in and correct me. Um, and he was kind of bullied at home. His father was very demanding and he ended up being a bully. So in this private boys school, they, he became a ringleader of a group of boys that had some influence and money. And uh, the others were on the outside and they used to bully the other, the other children. So it kind of goes through and they grow up and they talk about this man. And he, um, let's see, I'm trying to recall. Let me think for a second here. He um, um, was not a good friend to the people he was friends with, really. He was kind of a, a playboy. He was online and he got involved with a much younger woman on, on this online dating site business and it ended up being the sister of his wife. And she got pregnant and he wanted her to have an abortion and she wouldn't have an abortion. So at the wedding, when it ends up that that's her ex-lover, that her sister, older, more established in the industry, quite competent sister um, is marrying this man. And actually he's a fraud. I mean, he, he stole a job from his best friend who was actually the person who did all this and, and, and he was in a ringleader and it just goes on and on and on about how they're going to have this wedding on this island. And you don't really know until the end who the murderer is going to be which was a surprise for me um, because they talk about these different characters and some of these boys. And it's a very, at the beginning of the book, they talk about this young man that they bullied and he did pass away and it all revolves around him. So um, I thought it was pretty good because usually I can predict pretty much on these books. I read so much detective books and thrillers like this that I can usually tell who is the bad guy, who is the good guy. And uh, this one caught me off guard at the end. I don't know, Linda, you have anything to say to it? No, uh, nothing other than I enjoyed the book too. Right. And I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was surprised at the end. I, it caught me yeah, off it guard. Yeah, it was, you know, we both read a lot of mysteries and detective right. stories. So it was kind of caught both of us off guard. 
um, it, the rating on uh, Goodreads, they gave it a four. So I, I thought, well, it was a good solid four. If I, if I had to uh, report on it, I'd say it's a good solid four. So that, that's that one. And then on my other book box one, Over the Falls, uh, for Rebecca Hodge. I finished that, what, two, two months ago, I believe? Anyway, it, uh, I can relate to this one too. It's another kind of a mystery thing, dysfunctional families between two sisters again. I don't know, I mean, it's a dysfunctional family thing now. Uh, but uh, uh, one becomes a drug addict and she steals this one sister who is quite an athlete's uh, fiance and uh, she marries him and it's a disaster and he steals money and they disappear. And then it ends up with a son that shows up at her doorstep looking for the mother. And then they go through this whole thing to find the, her sister. And with it's kind of a discovery and a closeness that she develops with her nephew that she really knew nothing about. So, um, but I relate to it because it goes about whitewater rafting. And they're doing it in Colorado. Well, I did in Colorado twice whitewater rafting, but the most scariest whitewater rafting I did was actually in Santa Fe when they were training for the Olympics. We went down the rafts and I've got pictures of us going down through that. And I myself and a, uh, a lady from Hawaii who does these paddling with these big ocean canoes, <laughs> they put us both in the front end of this thing. and. And the water coming off of those mountains at that time was so darn cold. I'll never forget that. And so when they start talking about the treachery of these whitewater rafting, I relate to the Santa Fe trip I took now to my Colorado. They, Amy, my daughter, Amy was much, much, much younger then. And it was much milder, you know, floating kind of thingies. But the one we did in Santa Fe, they had a way her take her height and everything before they would let her on the boat. And there was three of us that went down and uh, one boat got pushed to the rocks and couldn't get out. One boat hit a rock and two of the people popped out of it. We all had to wear life vest. Ours made it all the way through, but I've never paddled in my life so hard. I'm thinking my baby's back there and she was sitting right next to the oarsman in the back. And I thought, oh my God, I'll never forget this as long as I, but we've got pictures showing that we actually did this thing. And it looked like we were in the Olympics going down those rapids when you show the pictures on um, National Geographic, we did it. So I could relate going to the book that way, but the story was real good, it has a good evening. It's kind of soap opery. So other than that, I'd say it's an okay read. I would give it probably a three because it is kind of soapy with the uh, love triangles, the stealing of money and et cetera. But the adventure part was good. That's about it. I mean, I've read a couple of really bow wows, so I won't even mention those. <laughs> yeah. And you said that was over the falls. Mm -hmm. okay. If you like that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't started anything new. I have things checked out, but I haven't started anything. So I'm kind of between between books. I know I'm kind of um, bracing myself because next, I sorry, I got my camera off. My internet connection is kind of wonky. Oh yeah. Um, next, yeah. I, think, I think, it's, think it's the weather. Mine's kind of wonky too. Yeah. I just picked up the new book one. I'm kind of interesting about, uh, 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 oh. You know, they, they play bridge. I know because we have friends that played bridge when they had relatives were in Auschwitz and were able to get away. And this book here is about, uh, uh, oh God, what is it? What did you send me, Mari? It's actually- Oh, the last, check, the last Checkmates? Yes. So the last, last it's, checks, it's, yeah. yeah. I haven't started it yet, but it looks like it would be something I'd be interested because I could relate to this too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks good. I yeah, we like it. And I also saw the program too that was on TV with that that young girl. When uh, oh, oh, um, I can't the think of the name of it. the chess the chess yeah. um series oh, yeah. on that Netflix. young girl that did that. I thought yeah. that was a fascinating series they did on her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Anyway, ladies, I'm going to leave you. I have <laughs> other things. I've had so many phone calls here while this was going today. It's a crazy day for me. Have a, have a happy Thanksgiving. I'll you see too. You Thanks for having me.